<laughs> Thank you guys for coming out today. My name is Alton Delaney. Uh, I am an artist and I make art. Uh, you can see there's art all around the room. Uh, the debate over whether or not something is art, I guess, is it died 100 years ago when Marcel Duchamp entered his urinal into the exhibition in 1917 and called it a fountain. And since then, we know that anything the artist calls art is art. Uh, I take that debate, I take a little, what's left of the fire out of that debate by just calling it art, putting the word art on it, so we, we know that it's art. So as an artist, I'm interested in a couple of things. One, I'm interested in the power of art to transform objects, images, or actions. And then I'm interested in how the artist has this kind of divine power to, almost like an alchemist, turn anything into an art. Uh, when we look at something like this, it's no longer just fabric wrapped around uh, stretcher bars with pigment on it. I think we would all agree that that's a painting. Uh, and so with the ready-made concept or the, or the found object concept uh, is similar. Anything that we call art, put into a gallery or museum setting, then becomes art. I'm going to do this tour a little, let's talk a little differently than I normally do today because I'm going to try to like walk around the room so we can actually, we're filming and so we want to kind of capture all the pieces. Uh, so feel free to, to pit it as, as we, we turn around the room. Uh, so one of the things I experiment with, you might have saw right when you walked in outside, is signage because I'm very fascinated with the idea of signage. Uh, as you notice, there was directional uh, implications on the sign. There was the arrow pointing in, in either direction. So a sign is an interesting thing. Was, uh, we're kind of governed and regulated by signs wherever we go. In particular, in, when we're driving, right? There's traffic signs everywhere, there's street signs, there's things telling us. And these are both informational and they're directional. Uh, I did a residency out in Marfa, Texas, and I driving between here and Marfa, I was surprised, first of all, about how, how open it is and how much there's how much of nothing there is out there. And then the occasional thing you would see would be the sign that I came to really embrace the sign and uh, appreciate the sign. And th then I was thinking like, well, most of us will stop at a stop sign even if there's no one around. So the sign is this object that kind of has this power over us. Uh, and then I took it one step forward in this particular collection by adding the arrow to it. Because now that it's pointing at something else. So is the object itself the artwork or is it directing us to look next to it at the object next to it that's the artwork? That's kind of the conceptual question there. Uh, the title of the show is uh, Art Provocateur, as you see here uh, on the wall. This was a title given to me by uh, Glass Tire, which is an online uh, magazine that talks about the art world of Houston and Texas and beyond. Uh, for some of my previous pieces, they labeled me as such. And then when Heidi and I were talking about what to call the show, we thought, when that article came out and they said that about me, I said, Heidi, here's the title of my show, <laughs> Art Provocateur. <laughs> Uh, so, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, kind of how the work is provocative. I mean, conceptual art in itself can be very provocative. The fact that someone can, you know, just put the word art on a canvas and call it art, that's, that has a, a layer of provocation. But then there's some other pieces that I'll talk about, uh, again, as we circulate the room. But these are two examples, kind of a signage that are behind me here. And I think these two, uh, one of them is kind of screaming the word sign at you. I've experimented a, little, a lot with neon. I actually have neon signs that are flashing, and I have ones with marquee racing lights. And I've done a number of them. And then that one maybe is shouting the word art at you, and this one is maybe whispering the word art at you. Uh, the title of this piece is Art Shadow. I was really trying to create this idea that even subtly and softly that it could still communicate something, kind of this color field, minimalist type approach to art, and still be a work of art. I'm sure one of you have a big modern white home. This would be lovely <laughs> in your home. Um, in the center of the room, you may have noticed when you walked in, this is a piece I call Art Monument. So uh, this piece was actually inspired by, I was living uh, abroad. Well, not abroad. I did live abroad, but I was living, I spent a long, I grew up in Splendora, and then I spent 20 years living in New York and LA, and I lived in Brazil, and I, I spent a lot of time in London. And... Upon coming home, my parents had this big announcement. They said, well, there's something we want to show you. They took me to the, the Splendor Cemetery and showed that they had bought a family plot. Uh, <laughs> and they're like, here's your, your, here's your spot right here. Uh, and so I'm like, oh, interesting. I own a piece of real estate in, in Splendor, the six by eight foot chunk of land in the cemetery. Um, they also pre- uh, 
inscribe their own tombstone and have it placed there so they're like ready <laughs> they're ready. Like, oh, when the ready. time comes. She said, I was like, Mom, that's a little morbid. And she goes, no, it's pragmatic. All you have to do is show up. So uh, I've been obligated to show up for that. But I started looking around. I started thinking, what should I do with this plot of land? Should I, you know, I've worked with public art. I'm like, should I create a piece of public art that can go here? Uh, what can I get away with? And then I thought, I was thinking about the artist Gordon Mata Clark from New York, who actually, at a certain point in the 60s, was actually going around buying little un unclaimed slivers of real estate in Manhattan and declaring them as, I mean, some of them were like inches by inches, but then he was actually buying them and titling them and, and creating artworks out of them. And then I was looking around the cemetery and I was realizing, I had this realization that most people are not artists. And yet, when they leave this realm, the one thing they leave behind is this sculpture in the park to remember them by, the monument or the tombstone. And so I thought, you know, a lot of people think that a, a, a tombstone, or, or I call this piece art monument, that it represents death, but in fact, it represents immortality because this is the thing that will actually last and last and last. So I started looking around and I found a, 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 a stone carver over on Robbins uh, Boulevard, right by the the big cemetery over here, uh, who was actually an artist himself, so I worked with him, and we carved this piece, and he said it's guaranteed to last a minimum of 2,000 years. So, <laughs> it also probably weighs about 2,000 pounds. Uh, a piece that goes, the, the, the companion piece uh, is this piece on the corner course, which is art urn. Uh, uh, this piece is inspired by the artist John Baldessari, some of you may know John Baldessari was a conceptual artist as well. He just died like last year. He taught out at UCLA. But famously, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, he changed his artistic style. And he took all of his existing paintings to a crematorium and burned them. Because he wanted to, he didn't want that existing anymore. Because he wanted a brand new style to represent the work that he created. So he burned a lot of his art. So I have myself recently been... Uh, uh, changing studios and remodeling my studio, and I'm going through years of accumulation of artwork. Some of them have just been damaged over time. Some of them, you know, uh, were damaged by whatever reason, and some of them were just some of them were just bad artwork. So I took and cremated uh, a, a large body of the older pieces and burned them, and that's what is actually in the urn. So this is actually 101 pieces. There was 100 pieces that were uh, uh, burned, and then they put inside. And then just to show you uh, what cremated paintings look like, um, there's like there's like little chunks of canvas and, and paint, and it was a, they burned down to nothing, but yet there was still kind of this shadow of them left, which was, which was very interesting. So um, I put these two pieces together, which I'll just talk a little bit about. Uh, well, while we're on the subject of burning your art, as Heidi was saying, everyone gets a gift in my show. Uh, this is uh, Carlos Cruz Diaz is an artist. Uh, no, sorry, Felix Gonzalez Torres is an artist that I really like, who is a conceptual artist. And he famously did piles of candy in his show. Maybe you've seen his work, but Whitney has a bunch of his yeah. stuff in New York, and you can actually take a piece of candy. So everyone that comes to the show today, up on the bar on your way out, there is books of art matches. So that you can go and cremate some art, too, <laughs> if you would like. Just make sure it's your art you're burning and, and not someone else's art. Um, so, I don't know. I guess these are, there are knitted pieces. These were inspired by my grandmother, who, who did knit. And her whole house was a doily under every single thing in the entire house. And she was always very proud of them. And when she died, I got this huge collection of doilies. And I was always like, what am I going to do with these? And for a while, I tried them, but they just weren't my style. And then I thought, well, how can I make something like that my own style? And then I found it of this woman who was a knitter. And so I kind of recreated some of them, but then added my own spin to them. So I guess I'll talk about this wall. Uh, this goes back to our signage conversation that we were having a little earlier. These are all hand-painted signs. For the two pieces on the outer side, I went to a car show and I met a um, this hot rod car painter. And it was a it was a female. I call her a chick because that's what she called herself. She's a car painting chick. Uh, she paints these things and she does this excellent job. And she hangs out in a total muscle testosterone boys world of hot rod vintage cars and goes to these car shows and paints like flames going down the side of these cars. So. 
I know Houston is like an art car town, right? So I'm like, well, I want to create pieces that kind of commemorate the art car phenomenon here, but without putting an actual car in the gallery. So I worked with her, her name is Cherie, um, and she, we des I designed these pieces, and then over the course of a, a couple of months, she painted these for me. Actually, she was very fast, too. The, the couple of months was because I took so long getting her the design and everything, but once she had it, she was super fast uh, cranking these out. The funny thing is she has a uh, she has a little five-year-old son, and when I was picking up this one, which was the last one, he said, hey, and then we kind of made friends because I'd been over there a few times to her studio, and she's like, he said, hey, if you'd learn to paint, you could paint these yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I have a master's degree in art. I know how to paint. Um, but I really like these, and again, there there is something um, um, fun about working with different people, collaborating with different people on the work uh, to get kind of different results. As Heidi was saying earlier about the centerpiece, uh, um, this is a uh, actual election sign. Except, well, actually, it's not. This is the art sign because the actual the the the, the election sign you have to say political advertising paid for by the candidate. So on this one, I put promotional advertising, and I wanted to create a painting kind of commemorating this run for mayor. So I live in Splendora. I'm a fifth-generation Splendoran. I uh, grew up out there. I was very lucky. I always was art artistically inclined and artist-identified, and I was very lucky that at an early age, uh, I discovered that the artist James Searles was also in Splendora and had this terrific studio. So I went over and introduced myself and became like the assistant, the studio assistant, or the the volunteer or the whatever needed to be done just so I could hang out over there with other artists. And it was great because I was hanging out over there uh, as a kid, but there was always someone coming in and out, Jesus Morales or the art guys or um, Mark Alexander. There was always someone coming in and out, these really great Houston artists that I got to see and see them firsthand as a kid. So that was a great inspiration of kind of a role. Well, James in particular was a role model of, that you could have a career as an artist. Uh, he quit his job teaching at the University of Houston to pursue his artwork and raise his family uh, and, and build this incredible empire out there. Uh, it's a it's a 12,000 square foot space we have set on 200 acres of forest. And we are actually hosting, uh, at the end of this month, October 26th, we're hosting an event out there with Park Sculpture Month Houston. We're hosting a James Searles retrospective. So if you all want to come out to Fedora, it'll be a great time to come out and see the space. Um, so I guess I'll just keep rotating. Well, so now while we're here, I'll talk about one more. So back to the art pro provocation. Uh, so I did a few pieces of inspired by the art. I was thinking about what gets attention. Like I was saying, I am the world's most famous gift wrap artist. So I, I, I understand how media works. I work with media a lot. I've had a publicist in New York, in New York for the last 10 years. Uh, my career as the world's most famous gift wrap artist has, is now in its 11th year um, and I, I really gained a lot of success in that world of getting my name out there. I view it as performance art, just like I, I view, um, um, just like I view running for office. It's kind of it's kind of this public art because you're putting yourself out there, and it's kind of performance art because you're you're we're acting in these roles. So as the world's most famous gift artist, I always say. I'm an artist, and this is my art, and my job is just to inspire you, and I want you all to create something. And as a candidate for office, I'm also running on a platform the city beautification, and how I want to bring art and beauty to the town, and how I want to have say on artistic decisions, whether it's landscaping, or painting of the new water tower, or whatever it is. How big is Pandora? Population 1,200 people, so it's very <laughs> tiny. And only 10% of the population votes, so we're really talking about 100, 120 votes, make or break. Uh, so, and it's a simple... People are very related. Uh, we just went on Ancestry.com and realized that uh, my mom and the current mayor are third cousins. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm fifth generation for theirs, so there was a lot of opportunity in five generations for people to get to, to, get, to, get to be related, right? <laughs> Uh, so if yeah. I did, if I didn't mention it, he lives on Newland Street. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and yesterday, I, my mom and I went driving around. I was putting out a campaign sign, and it's Dulaney Street. It's Hood Street, which is her maiden name. It's Welch Street, which is the current mayor's name. It's like all these family names, you know, all these family names that I've grown up knowing my whole life. So it's super interesting. 
and uh, I'm having a really good time. How many miles away? Is it's 35 miles north of here. So it's it's just past Kingwood on Highway 59. But it's not the suburbs. Yeah, it's really rural. It's the once you get out there, it's it's funny. Like Kingwood. Well, now it's now 99 goes kind of far out there. It goes all the way to Caney. But that's really the edge of civilization, is the, the Grand Parkway. And then once you're beyond that, you're really outside the loop. Outside the third loop, or however many we have around Houston now. But so I've always appreciated press, and appreciated how to work with marketing, and how to get my name out there. And so a few years ago, when I came back to Texas and started this collection, I thought, uh, and I was in the graduate program with the University of Houston, which is where I met Heidi, and I thought, well, I, I consciously was thinking, how are some ways to get some press about what I'm doing, get some press for the program. I even got a, I even got a uh, hired one semester to be the spokesperson for my department because I was in the interdisciplinary department. So they were actually paying me to get press for the university. So um, uh, the first, yeah, I'll talk about this piece. So the first piece I did, uh, I was invited to participate in the show in one of the exhibitions at the Blaffer Museum. And the Blaffer is the museum. Have you guys been to the Blaffer Museum over there? Okay. So the Blaffer is the museum that's on the campus. And this was during the time that, um, this was in 2016 when campus carry was becoming legal in Texas. So it's when it was becoming legal for you to carry a concealed handgun on university campuses in Texas. So I decided I would create a piece called Art Gun. So my piece was a gun, like the famous clown gun, but when you pull the trigger, it doesn't seem bang, it says art. So uh, I decided I would do this piece. I used a 22 caliber uh, revolver. It's an actual gun that's in the piece. I chose a 22 for a couple of reasons. One is it's the, it's the same gun that was used in the famous piece called Shoot by Chris Burton, where in the 70s Chris Burton had an artist, his studio assistant, shoot him in the arm as a performance art piece. Uh, Chris Burton also taught at UCLA, so they get all the good, they get all the good ones out there at UCLA. Uh, and then it was the same weapon also uh, that Marina Abramovich has used in one of her performances. She's used the 22 revolver. Andy Warhol has photographed uh, even Elvis with 22 revolvers on his each hip. So it has an art historical context to why I use this gun. Uh, however, the museum curator or the campus police were not very interested in that. And they said the decision was made that the gun was, because you could see it, it was considered open carry. And so it was not allowed because the law said you could have concealed, you could have a uh, concealed weapon, but not an open carry. So the gun was not allowed to be in the exhibition. So I took out the gun. And I entered the piece without the gun into the show, and it was in the show. And the way I framed it, I actually cut around the gun, so the gun kind of was recessed into a, 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 this blue velvet background. So even without the gun, you could still see the perfect impression of what was supposed to be there. And opening day, there was news crews outside. We had tons of press. It made, it made local, national, and even international uh, art news. And during the process of it, me and my mom decided... Well, I decided, and I drug my mom along with me because moms, moms are like that. Uh, we, we started taking shooting lessons, and we actually got our license to carry. So at the night of the opening, I could have technically had my gun in my pocket, but I was not allowed to show my gun on the wall, under glass, in a museum, with security guards and cameras, because of the way the law was written, which I think was kind of some... Uh, beautiful irony. Let's just let's just leave it at that. So that piece was super successful. Uh, there was a couple other pieces that happened after that, uh, and then the next year, when I was invited to be in the next show, as fate would have it, it, the bathroom bill was going around. So I created the art restroom piece, uh, which which actually now this is a thing that you see on restrooms because of because of the big hoopla about the art restroom bill that was happening. But I was like, anyone's welcome. And, uh, and then I also wanted to experiment with doing some pieces in Braille. I have a friend that has a blind daughter who loves art, but she oftentimes is not allowed to touch art, right, unless it's public art that's outside. So I thought, well, I'll do a piece that Zelda can actually touch and enjoy. So this piece was inspired by that. And this actually hung at the Blackbird Museum for quite a while. They really enjoyed having it as a part of their, part of their show. So I guess I will, we talked about these. I'm going to rotate you guys all the way around. Um, I, again, I grew up in Texas. 
My grandfather was an actual cowboy. The cowboy hat is not a fashion statement. It's actually, you know, I've earned this by living in Texas for, or being born in Texas. Uh, I remember as a kid, my grandpa, they, we, they all had horses. My grandma had a garden until she was like almost 80 years old. Uh, they, were, they were authentic uh, people, uh, country people. And, um, and then even working with James Searles, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of his wooden work, the black part of it is actually burned or, or uh, somehow torched. It's not, it's not painted black. It's actually burned black. So fire as a reductive and destructive and yet creative uh, element has always been big in my, my artwork. I've been, I started branding a number of things as a young artist. I was making my own branding irons and branding wood panels. I've always been very interested in also mail art. So I started doing a line of branded postcards. Here's one of the postcards that I sorry uh, that I created. So this is the art postcard, and um, we actually each show I have I do an edition of ten of these, and Heidi sells them here at the gallery. So uh, uh, I make these postcards. You buy them as as patrons and, and and collectors, and then you leave your address, and so then I fill it out to you, and I put my seal, my gold seal of art approval on it. And then I drive out to the middle of West Texas to a little town called Art, Texas. And so it's actually postmarked as art as well. So the U.S. government is actually validating this as a piece of art. So you really get one, two, three pieces of art in one in the, in the mail art postcard. Uh, so I branded wood. I branded all types of material. I started branding leather and this sort of thing. I did a residency. In, uh, my second residency in Marco was all about... Uh, doing stencils, either in water stencils or sand stencils, or branding. Uh, and I was going around branding fence posts and those kind of things and just leaving my mark in Marfa. I, I'm sure uh, they appreciated that. Uh, and then last year, in 2018, I was approached by another artist who asked me if I would consider branding him. So the photo that some of you can see, oh, or you can take a look at it when you get a chance. So this is a still from the video that's called Art Brand. Uh, uh, Art Brand Conquista, because Conquista was, is the, the, uh, the name of the other artist. So he and I collaborated on this piece. Actually, he and I and two friends, we created this performance around it. Uh, we were really, I was, I was, well, I was concerned about a lot of the, 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 the things involved in it. Uh, so I hired an attorney to drop the paperwork. There were releases, there were all this kind of thing. And it turns out that in the state of Texas, um, branding is not recognized as an official form of, mod of body modification. If you want to do tattooing or piercing, you can, but you should be licensed to do that to other people. But branding is kind of this weird area. Even though branding is a growing body modification thing that people are doing now, it's kind of this gray area. And it could technically be considered assault. And in the state of Texas, assault cannot be consensual or it doesn't dismiss the assault charges. So uh, the attorney recommended that we create a ritual around it and that we make sure, very sure that it was identified as this artistic uh, endeavor and that it was not uh, assault. assault. <laughs> so we invoked the four elements uh, to create this piece. So we had a performance and it was a dark and stormy night. And uh, we had a, one of the performers invoke the, the element of air, came out with a sage stick and sage the room. I came out and invoked the earth by doing one of my sand stencils on the floor uh, with this art stencil. The, the stencil's removed and it says art in the sand. Uh, uh, we invoked the, the element of water. We had a woman, his, his partner, who actually was five months pregnant at the time, came out and watered this aloe vera plant. Um, and then we invoked the... The, the Dia de Fuego, the God of Fire. Uriel turns on the blowtorch. I'm holding the branding iron. He heats it, and then I brand him as art. Uh, by the power of all the elements, we invoke the power to, to, to make and to be art, and he was branded. Then there was a healing ritual where we took the, the aloe vera, or his, his partner took the aloe vera and doctored the, the new mark. Uh, the good news is it's been it's been a year now. The brand is really beautiful. It's uh, it's it, it's flesh colored, so it, it almost looks like it's uh, Heidi says it's embossed sometimes because that's really what it looks like is this embossed marking on it. Uh, he recently provided released the first 
picture of it. But if you guys are interested in that, uh, there is there are two videos on, on YouTube about it. One is the 29 seconds, and that's the sizzle reel. That's just the teaser of it. Sizzle reel, get it, you got it. Uh, and then the other one is about five minutes, and that's the full performance of our brand. Um, and so I just will conclude by saying one last thing, as Heidi was saying. Uh, everyone gets a gift, so there are matches up here. So if you would like some art matches, you can go and burn something or burn someone. Oh, so this is I, this is from that collection leading up to this when I was branding things. Uh, I'm also a part-time art consultant and decorator, so I do a lot of decor for people. Uh, and so, you know, there's decorative is, can be a dirty word in the art world. Like some artists don't want their work to be considered decorative. I personally don't have a problem with that at all. I think this could be a beautiful piece in anyone's home. And plus, it, it's a statement piece because it is branded. And then it kind of leaks in this whole, the, the history of branding. Oh, I want to say one more thing about branding before I get off it. Uh, is that talking about where we started about being a conceptual artist. So there's kind of multiple uses of this word branding. Um, as, as artists, um, we brand ourselves as an artist, right? And then as, um, as an object maker, we then brand an object as art by, by calling it an art. This work is all very self-referential because whenever there is an art, it implies that it was obviously created by an artist. So even though these are not self-portraits by any means, it is referring back that it was created. It takes an artist to make an art. And then... Art making in general is usually a series of mark making, and the branding action is a series of mark. It's a mark making, right? I'm making a mark. So in doing this, I've marked on this, so I've branded this literally, and then I've branded it figuratively as a work of art, which thereby brands me as, that's my brand. I'm an artist, and I make art. Yes, yeah, so that's it. <laughs>